So I want to welcome you to our special service this morning, and particularly to family and friends of Zwan Zizulu, uh, a welcome to you. So while the service team does that, I want to explain what this day is about. It's a, it's a very special day in the life of Rosebank Union Church as we formally ordain Zwan Zulu uh, to pastoral ministry. Zwan and his wife Z became members of RUC uh, nine years ago already, uh, and Zwai has been serving as an elected elder for the past two years. And about a year ago, we appointed a call committee to begin a search process for uh, an associate pastor of discipleship. And at our recent church general meeting, uh, the call committee and the council recommended to the church that we call Zwai to this position. And as you know, he accepted that call uh, and you voted in favor of him coming and he began his ministry here on the 1st of October. And so as a consequence of that decision, it's our great privilege today to ordain him uh, to pastoral ministry and induct him as a pastor of RUC. Now, ordination is an event that occurs once only at the beginning of a person's ministry. And in Zwei's case, it's based on the fact that he believes in his heart that God has called him uh, in his grace and gifted him to be a pastor serving full-time. And on the basis of the church's calling him and recognition of his gifting and calling, we ordain him. And I think that's an important thing in this day and age. In our country, there's so many self-appointed pastors and self-appointed churches. And scripturally, we see that there's the role of the body of Christ to acknowledge gifts uh, and, and to call uh, people to ministry. And so we have that privilege today to do that. Now, the fact that we ordain Zwei today doesn't necessarily mean that Zwei will serve uh, as a pastor at RUC for the rest of his life. In the future, God may call him to serve at other churches, and should that happen, he would be inducted at those churches. But this morning, we both ordain him to ministry and induct him to RUC. So I hope that makes sense. One ordination, but in the course of a pastor's life, there may be several inductions. And I think this ordination service is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it provides Zwei with the opportunity to share with us something of his call to the Lord and his call to ministry. It also provides him with the opportunity to confirm but, but before us as the church gathered his belief in the scriptures and his commitment to be a faithful pastor uh, of God's word. And then it also provides me, as the interim senior pastor of RUC, with the opportunity to remind Zwei from the scriptures that this is a high and holy calling. And then finally, the service also serves as a reminder to you as church members. You can't watch these events today and not be moved to say, I want to pray and I want to support and I want to encourage Zwei and indeed all of those that are appointed to leadership in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17 says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. And that's part of Zwei's work, and so he is worthy of double honor. We're now gonna have a, a number of testimonies of some people that are close to Zwei and Z to share a few words. Firstly, Yanni Lars. He had the privilege of leading Zwei to the Lord on campus uh, a number of years ago. Yanni exposed Zwei to discipleship and birthed in Zwei uh, this desire to disciple others. And then we're going to hear from Samantha Roberts. She's a friend to both Zwei and Z and something of an aunt to their kids, Zoe, Nati, and Langa. And then we're going to hear thirdly from Bongani Habile, uh, one of the men that Zwei then in turn discipled on campus at Witz and Bongani is now heading up the ministry at UJ and he worships at Parkhurst Community Church, the church that we planted. So I'm gonna ask those three to come in turn uh, and share with us. So we'll start with you, Yanni. Good morning, church. Uh, thanks for this opportunity, Zwei, uh, to share a little bit about you. Um, guys, uh, as Pastor Justin said, it started uh, a long time ago. I was there in the beginning. Um, I'm briefly going to share about uh, when, when Zwei came to faith and, and then a little bit after that. Um, and, and it started 12 years ago, actually, when the Springboks beat England in the Rugby World Cup in France. It was in France. That's when it started. <laughs> so Zwei was a first year university student at Wits and, and I was working with Campus Outreach on the campus. And it was one uh, very late night. Um, now, back then, uh, I, I used to go to gym, so I was a little bit bigger, and, and I wore these vests. 
and, and I had bushy hair, and I didn't use to shave. Um, but, and I drove this white combi slash taxi that had bumps and scratches. So it was really late. Zwei was coming uh, up the hill there at Witz, and, and I was driving down. Um, so you can imagine that that picture is, is uh, for somebody who's not a Christian, that picture is very safe. So, so, so Zwei, Zwei saw me, and, and so that's where we, that was our first official point of contact. Um, and I learned that Zwei was working at Exclusive Books, and he had to take two taxis to get to Exclusive Books. And, and what he was earning at Exclusive Books and, and the cost of him working at Exclusive Books was almost not worth it. So I, I suggested to him, let me call your employer and try to get you transferred to Exclusive Books in Cresta. Little did we know that the Lord had bigger plans for you than Exclusive Books. Um, so I eventually, um, very important, because of, so I obviously thought, look, whatever I've done in my life, that guy's done worse. So, so he confided in me his, his colorful personal uh, pre-Christ life. Um, and he, you know, he spoke about all the lovely things that he did. Uh, invited him to Bible study. He came to Bible study. He came to the events. He started engaging. Um, and Zwa became a Christian in, in his first year uh, of our ministry. Um, and, and the parable of the mustard seed was clearly illustrated in his life because um, Bible study became a priority. The, 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 the events that we had became a priority. Um, he started joining a discipleship group uh, with three or four other men, and that was a priority in his life. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and so we carried on, um, you know, working out our salvation. And one of the things I, I like to refer to is, you know, in, in our circles, um, us Christians, we like to talk about the 180. And I always wondered why we say that, because no one ever really does the 180. You know, um, uh, just two weeks ago, I had an argument with my wife. You know, so I went from 175 down to 169, and then we repented, we spoke, and I think I'm back at, at 180. Um, but, but for a lot of people, you know, the, the, you work out your salvation, it's a process. You work with the Lord, you repent, it's a process. If ever there was anybody who came really close to doing a 180, it was Zwei Zulu. Having confided in me all of those colorful things in his life, in the, in the context of Bible study and discipleship group and, and growing in the Lord, He made difficult decisions that take normal people months to process and maybe even years. At the reading of the text with the command to obey, he made difficult decisions one after the other like that. That's why I think you did a 179. You really came close to the 180. Um, and then, you know, leadership is a, is a really big subject and there are libraries written about it. And Christian leadership, not too different. Um, if we were to take the life of Zwei as a case study for leadership, I would have to say that there are two attributes in, in your life which makes this calling really appropriate, and, and I'm really excited about this. Um, and those two things are, are ownership and conviction. Um, Bible study is supposed to be an hour on campus. Because of Zwei, it was never an hour. It was always an hour and a half. Later on in the year, we joined this discipleship group where we would meet three, four times a week and, and we would confess things to one another, be vulnerable with one another, pray with one another, go out to campus and, and, and share the gospel with other first years and other second years with each other. We just did the Christian thing. Being a student, you have the luxury of time and so you can really do that a lot. Um, and and, and Zwei really, uh, our discipleship groups would start at six with dinner. You know, and then we'd, we'd, you know, share and have Bible study. Because of Zwei, I think I got pulled over 12 times in one year because we would get back from discipleship group the next morning just from asking questions and talking about girls and should I do it or should I not do it? Should I ask her out and this and that and all these things. And it was an every week thing. Um, so Zwei, I'm, I'm really encouraged uh, that, that you are here. I think you belong here. And to the church, um, 12 years later, We are ordaining Zwei, and the Springboks battered England again in the final. So I think if history is anything to go on, um, Rosebank Union, you guys have a responsibility to just make sure that Zwei is involved in some form of church matter for the sake of the box. Please stay here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Samantha, and I've been asked to come and share as a friend of the Zulus, um, which I really counted a joy and a privilege to call them um, not just my friends, but my family. 
Um, as I was reflecting on my friendship with the Zulus, I thought about what Paul says in Philippians 1. And he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And so as I look back and I reflect on our friendship and all that we've done, my heart can't help but to thank God. And so I just think of our life and ministry as co-laborers. I was just thinking of how we've sat in many, many rooms and we've prayed to the Lord for people to come to know Jesus. We pray for them to walk with Jesus. And we have been for the last eight or nine years equipping laborers side by side. And I really count it as a joy. Um, I think of when Zwa transitioned from working at KPMG to coming on campus. I think I was always so blown away by how much he really did count it as a privilege to serve the Lord. Like when we would have our days of prayer, which we do every month, he would say, I can't believe this is my job, you know, that he would get to pray um, for the students on the campus. And so that's been my experience with him. And, and anyone who's been in ministry, you know that there's always, the, it's the roller coaster at times. There's the, the joys and there's the challenges. But I think it's been such a privilege for us, you know, Zwa and Z, for us to come together and ride those roller coasters together um, and trust the Lord together and seek the Lord together and be amazed by the fruit of what the Lord has done. Um, And then I think another aspect of our friendship is not that we were just laborers together on the campus, but there comes a shift when friends become like family. And I think for me, especially, you know, not being from South Africa, um, the Zulus have invited me in to be a part of their family. And I feel like that's been such a great joy and delight. And as Justin mentioned, to be an aunt to their kids. I've gotten to be, you know, there at the hospital for all of their births, except that last one. So the last one, we made a pact, him and I, that he wouldn't be born until I got back from Cape Town. But he managed to come on the day that I was flying back. But if you've seen him, you know that was easily forgivable. But, um, but it really has been a privilege to be their aunt, to be excited for their birthdays, and to, I think, do auntie things, like pick them up from school, which is like one of my favorite things, or go to their school concerts, which for me is like a whole new experience. So even getting to experience the culture in that way, it's been such a joy. But I think even for Zwan Z and friendship, I think just their faithfulness to show up, you know, and I think that many people can also say that they show up, whether it be I hit a curb and my tire busted. So Zwan shows up to change my tire or I'm having a rough day and Z just shows up at my door just to be a good sister. And so, so thankful for them and thankful that the church gets to experience the Zulus in that way um, and in this season of ministry. And so my prayer for you guys, I think of Psalm 1, blessed is the man and woman who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and life and night, and his leaves does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. And so that is my prayer that in this season of ministry that the Lord will continue to bear fruit in you and through you. I love you guys. Yeah, morning church. So my name is uh, Bongani. Um, so I met Zwai in 2013 while I was doing my, my first year at, at VETS. Um, so I came from a, came from a township, uh, experienced some, you know, brokenness at home. I think growing up without parents, you know, specifically without a, you know, without a father figure. Uh, but the Lord, you know, by his grace had, had saved my life. In, in my last year of, of high school. So I came to university really earning, you know, to grow in my relationship with God and, and be around people who, who were about that. Um, I had met a guy at my residence who was part of Campus Outreach. And, you know, we just grew in our friendship. And he invited me to a, a weekly meeting that Campus Outreach was, was having on campus. Uh, and so I thought, you know, let me, let me, let me check it out. And so... On that night of the event, you know, Zwai was uh, doing a talk uh, there. So they were doing a series called uh, Behind the Media. So basically they would look at different songs, uh, movies, and analyze them and, and look at, okay, what are they saying? And what does the gospel say in light of that? Uh, on that night, Zwai was doing a, a talk on Adele's song, uh, Tending Tables. Uh, <laughs> 
and he was talking about, I mean, in the song Adele talks about, you know, she's just been heartbroken and how next time she's going to do things better. You know, she's going to choose wisely and stuff. And so I was talking about how it's, it's in us as human beings, right, to try and fix things. Uh, but we have a condition as human beings uh, that we're sinful. We can't fix ourselves, that we need a savior, you know, to fix us. Um, yeah, I think it was that night I was convinced, you know, that this is the community, you know, of people that I, I wanted to be around and do life uh, and do life with. And so I think this is where really our discipleship process uh, began. Me and Zwei, uh, we began a journey together, you know, through Bible studies, you know, being in discipleship groups uh, with, with other guys. And I think over the years, you know, in the discipleship process with him, you know, it, it, became, it became more than just uh, meeting and, and doing Bible study or, or devotions, but we really did life, you know, together. You know, you know when Paul tells the church in, in Thessalonica that, you know, we did not only share the gospel with you, but we shared our very own lives. And, and this is what I, I got to experience as a, as a student. You know, I, I, it moved from, you know, seeing Zwai just as a spiritual guru who comes on campus, you know, to tell us about the Bible and Jesus. But I, but I saw Zwai as a father. I, I saw Zwai as a husband. You know, I saw Zwai, you know, as a friend, a, a lover of his family. And I saw Zwai as a big fan of Orlando Pirates, which is a big deal. It's a big deal for him. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we became friends, you know, who read the Bible, but also carried each other's burdens, right? carried each other's uh, pains, frustrations, you know, struggles and, 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 and victories. And to this day, we still do that. Um, and I know, I mean, the whole process was not, you know, was not easy. It, it, it did cost you. It did cost you. Uh, I remember as students, we decided to go to Mike's kitchen. Um, so it was at night, uh, and we were the last ones to leave the restaurant. Um, unfortunately, so we left the restaurant. We got to, so we were going to take a bus to go back to campus. We got to the bus stop, and the last bus just left. And it was like after midnight. And we were these students without licenses, without cars. And guess what we did? We called Zoi. And, and he, you know, he, you know, he came. He came, he sacrificed his night and got us uh, back to campus. Uh, I remember, you know, during, um, especially our last two years of discipleship on campus, when Fees Must Fall was happening, and, uh, which was a tough time for us in, in discipleship. Uh, you know, the misunderstandings and the disagreements. Uh, but I remember, bro, like you never, you know, you never stopped pursuing us. You, you, you didn't give up on us, you know, you initiated, we sat down, had conversations of understanding, and that was, you know, that was huge for me. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll forever be grateful for, for your investment in, in my life. You know, you, you helped me with, with my faith formation, but, all, uh, you know, you went above and beyond. You, know, you, you taught me everything that a young man should learn from his father. And so you were, you were a dad, man, to me, a dad that I never had. And so I'll, I'll, I'll forever be grateful for that. Uh, you've shaped so many things in my life, the decisions that I've made, the kind of husband that I am today is largely because of you and your life. Um, I'm, I'm thankful to you and Z, you know, for allowing him to do these things, you know, opening your homes, trusting us with, with your kids. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of you, man, and continue praying for you and then just to see the Lord using you, you know, in this context. So thank you so much. Man. This is why I want to invite you now to come and share with us as a congregation. Good morning, church. Please excuse my voice, I've been sick the last couple of days, uh, but I'm getting better, so hopefully I don't fall, <laughs> I don't, you know, fall here, <laughs> that would be a sin, but <clears throat> I'm struggling, but I will be fine. Yeah, I just wanted to 
uh, just to thank my family for being here and uh, the, co the whole congregation just for being a part of this important day uh, for me. Um, I just want to share a little bit of, of my story on how I came to, to faith. Yanni has shared a couple of things there which are very true. Uh, but when I stepped onto the university campus, the last thing I thought I would become was a Christian. That was the last thing on my mind. I had been raised in a Catholic family. Our matriarch, my great-grandmother, was a very strong influence to the family, and he was, she was a strong influence to me. Uh, so she had given me a charge as a, as a kid, and she had said, you need to go through baptism classes, you need to go all the way uh, to confirmation. So I did that, um, and I got baptized when I was 12 years, but I really had a deep misconception about the waters of baptism. So I thought that being sprinkled with the water, that will magically cleanse me. So now what I understood, because I also went to a Catholic school, I, I got a framework for what sin was. Quickly after my, my, my baptism, I fell into sin. And now the question that was lingering was, do I need to get baptized again? And do I need to get baptized over and over and over again each time I fall into sin? So that was a, a big uh, sort of misconception that I had. <clears throat> but all of it, I think all the efforts uh, that I had gone through, uh, going through the baptism classes, uh, really the motivation wasn't because I wanted to pursue God. The motivation was really, I want my great-grandmother to be pleased. Uh, so that, that was at the core of it. And this motivation to please others became a thing that defined me. So at school, I performed well so that my parents would be pleased with me. And, um, and not that it's wrong to please your parents, but if you are working so hard that the joy of even doing the thing is lost, you know, I, I don't think it, you know, I don't think it's right. Uh, but that was sort of like the, you know, the early years of my life. Um, I remember just as I was, I think I was about 16, I'd done uh, confirmation. And the, the question now was, okay, what's the next step? What is the next thing that I need to do? Um, and there was not really an answer. And I was heavy on the, on the parties as well. And so I'd go to a lot of social events. I remember one, one, one uh, occasion, we were at a party, and I remember just stepping out and looking into the crowd, and there was a question that hit me, and I don't know where it came from, but it just the question was, is this, is this it? Is this the ultimate, is this the pinnacle of what my life is? Is this the sum total of it? You know, and that question was never really answered. Uh, so I stepped onto the university campus. I get invited to a braai that Campus Outreach was hosting. Uh, in fact, I found this red, uh, red, red uh, invitation in my door, and I read it. It says, there's going to be a free braai. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you, you don't need to say anything else. So I went, I went to this, to this braai, you know. And really, for the first time, I, just, I was blown away just by the people that were there. I mean, we had a lot of great fun. It didn't feel like people had ulterior motives. Or just people were having clean fun. I don't know, there's no other way to describe it. It was just clean fun, you know? And I, I, I asked uh, one of the leaders that evening, I, I asked, what, is, what are you guys all about? There's something different about you and they told me that uh, we are these Christians that have started ministry on my campus at UJ uh, Bunting Road. And, and they, they said, look, we're going to have Bible studies. And then Yanni said, there's going to be pizza there. I was like, okay. <laughs> you don't need to say anything else. I'm coming, bruh. Uh, but those Bible studies really got started challenging my heart. And for the first time, I had the gospel of grace. I heard that I don't need to work to earn God's favor, as I've 
done the other things, right? I've worked to earn people's favor. I've worked to earn my parents' favor. They are my parents. They love me. Why do I need to then work for them to love me? They love me, you know? And uh, so Yanni explained, uh, I think we were going through John 15, and he explained, I was just trying to understand, like, you know, the whole thing about the vine and the branches. And, you know, the question that after he had explained the gospel and shared everything, the question I had was, okay, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do for this God who has done this amazing thing? And he said, nothing. You don't need to do anything. Christ has done it all. And that really, really blew my mind. And I think that was a turning point in my relationship with Christ. So I began a journey of just going through these Bible studies with pizza uh, with <laughs> and some ice skating on top of that. And we fell all the way through it. Uh, but there was a lot of just exposure to really the gospel. And, and the thing that I, I believe my great-grandmother had wished, I think, became true because she had a strong relationship with God. And I started having a relationship with God in 2007. But now I was one of the guys that used to tease Christians. So born again, you know, I was the one who mocked them. Now the question was, so people are going to mock me, you know? Uh, but, you know, a lot of people actually were shocked that I've turned around and become a Christian, that some people, some of my friends were asking, what is this thing that you are, what, why are you meeting with this guy? Why are you driving in this kumbi every week? What is happening you know, and I invited them, and some of them became Christians along the way. But that was my journey to faith. So after graduating, I started working in IT, uh, a job that I really, really loved. <clears throat> I worked for two great companies uh, in a very short space of time, and I really loved that. But I remained connected to the church that I was a part of. Um, and in that church, I was leading a small group. And I do believe that God was using the preparation for, for the small group time just to stir up a desire in me to do this more and more. And each week, I mean, I'd find myself in the office during lunch just preparing, opening up the Bible. And I really do believe that that's when God was really turning <clears throat> my heart towards ministry. And uh, I spoke to Z about it. And Z told me that she had been praying the same thing for me, just secretly. She hadn't shared that. She had just been praying that God would turn my heart because I wanted to do IT and she wanted to do ministry and she was in accounting at the time. Is this my water? I, it's not. I really need water. <laughs> I'll just drink it. <laughs> it was yours, just. Are you also sick? Oh my gosh. <laughs> How sick can I be? I'm already sick. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Where was I? But yeah, so while I was. Um, while I was in IT, I started sharing with Z just those desires to go into full-time ministry. And Z started sharing that she's feeling the same thing and she's been praying that. So that was one just affirming thing uh, for me in that journey. Uh, because we were doing well. She was in accounting, I was in IT. There was really, you know, no need for us to move. We were doing well, but God was really doing something. You know, so off we... You know, through godly counsel. <clears throat> Thanks, Brasile. Thanks. <clears throat> it's just. <laughs> <laughs> Is this yours now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I won't mix it up. I promise. Um, <clears throat> but I'm losing my train of thought here. Thanks, baby. 
so through godly counsel, we, we, we got to a decision to join Campus Outreach. And we've had the best eight years of our lives, just working with great people, meeting great students on the campus um, at WITS. So we spent six years at WITS, and the last two years we were working with uh, UJ, WITS, and Tux. So that was just a great experience. And over the last two years, just the Lord has been steering up my heart uh, for pastoral ministry, which that was the initial call that I had felt <clears throat> back in, in 2011. I wanted to be teaching God's word. I wanted to be preaching God's word. But I thought, let me start with campus ministry. Um, campus outreach had impacted me greatly when I was at university. And I wanted to go back on the campus and do the same for others. Uh, but I'm, I'm really thankful to be serving uh, Christ here at Rosebank. Uh, I really, really, really thank God. I see it as a great privilege uh, to be here, uh, particularly in, in the space that we're in as a country. Um, <clears throat> I'm no silver bullet, but I am trusting that the Lord will use, will use our time here really to see disciples mature. We want to see people come to know Christ. We want to see people equipped, and we want to see people sent. We want to see people grow. We want to see churches planted. We want to see many, many believers. We want to see many, many people come to know Christ in our city, in our continent. People are dying for a lack of knowledge. There are no people to go, and I really do think that the people sitting here represent those people that will go so that others will come and so that others will get to know Christ as you go. And that is my hope so I'm thankful, thankful to be a part of this bride of Christ. Yeah, that's me just. So as well as we come now to formally ordain you, I want to ask you a few solemn questions and would ask you to respond. Do you affirm your belief in the Bible as the inspired and inerrant word of God? and in the RUC statement of faith. I do. So why do you confess anew Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I do. Do you believe in your heart that you are truly called of God to pastoral ministry? I do. And then why do you promise to faithfully fulfill your duties as a pastor as required by the word of God? I will endeavor to do so, the Lord being my helper. Thank you. So as you've been called by the Holy Spirit to pastoral ministry, and as this congregation has recognized that calling, I therefore, on behalf of the leaders and members of RUC, declare you're ordained as a pastor. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Congratulations, Pastor's wife. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would propose a toast, but it's maybe a bit dangerous. <laughs> I'm going to ask Mike Combrink now to read the Word of God, to reread some of the passage that I shared with you, and it comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3. He's going to read from verse 14 through to chapter 4 and verse 5, and this text has been chosen for you as well. Thanks, Phil. So I hear, hear God's Word as I read them over your life. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness 
that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and, and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Okay. I'm going to ask the church council and fellow pastors, elders, any deacons here, as well as uh, the members of Zawai's community group that are here, and anyone who is close to the Zulu family who'd like to join us, please come and stand on the steps as we pray and commit Zawai and his family to the Lord. ask you as the congregation, let's stand as we pray and commission Zawai Zulu to the Lord, as well as pray for Zia's wife and his children. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you on this Sunday, day that you have ordained before the dawn of time. Thank you for Zawai's life. We thank you for the impact of his parents upon his life for those who shaped him as he grew up. <clears throat> and we thank you, Lord, that in your perfect timing, you brought him to yourself and you saved him. Thank you for all the ways that you used him at campus outreach. And even at the service, Lord, we recognize that we're part of the kingdom of God. And we pray, Lord, that his absence there, Lord, would be missed, but yet his work of equipping would continue to provide a legacy of leaders that can lead them. Father, we thank you then for calling him into pastoral ministry and then calling him into pastoral ministry here at Rosebank Union Church. And we want to pray for him and ask, Lord, that he would be a pastor who preaches the word in season and out of season, that looks to you, that finds his identity in you. Lord, I pray that his life, the life of his family and his home would impact the lives of each person that enters into those doors that you'd make his home a place of hospitality and love and of healing and of great witness. Lord, we do pray that you would keep him faithful. As things get hard, we know that the road can get tough. There can be opposition and criticism. Lord, when growth is slow and the fruit bearing seems meager, we pray that you would keep him faithful, that he would continue to sow seeds of diligence. We pray for his personal holiness, that you would protect him from the evil one, we ask that you'd bring key people into his life to hold him accountable that he can share with and be vulnerable with. Lord, may he be a real and authentic witness for you, someone that we can look to who is above reproach, not perfect, but is pressing on in his love for Christ. Give him watchfulness over his life and his doctrine. And then, Lord, we pray that you would make him an equipper. When the danger is there to seek glory for himself and to do all of the work on his own, Lord, may you make him an equipper May he see his life multiplied in the lives of others and may, may that be his deepest joy. Give him strength as he disciples and wisdom and Lord sensitivity and courage and boldness and leadership and so many beautiful things. Lord, we pray the fruit of the spirit over his life. And then Lord, we wanna pray for his marriage and family and we bring Z to you and for her role in this journey towards this day. Lord, we thank you for Zoe and Nati and Langer Lord, may they grow to love the church and not dislike the church. May, may you help Zwa to set boundaries, 
that he may prioritize his marriage and his love for his children and seek to disciple them first. And then, Father, we pray that you, by the power of your Spirit, would magnify Christ in his life. Lord Jesus, that you would be central in Zoar's life. May his love for you not grow cold. May he be fervent in serving the Lord. May you fan into flame the gifts that you've given him. We thank you for this life and the potential of his life at RUC and further afield. And Lord, we now commission him to pastoral ministry. We pray that his call upon your life would sustain him. Come and empower Zoar by your Holy Spirit. We know, Holy Spirit, that unless you breathe on him and through him, Lord, his work will be in vain. His labor will be for nothing. Lord, may we, your people, love him and pray for him, encourage him and hold him accountable to this high calling. And so I leave you with these words from the Apostle Paul. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I praise why that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God and now to him is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within you To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please take your seats.